Hello, London. Hello, London. <laughs> Welcome. This is Real Time Data and Web Applications with Node.js. Uh, thank you all for coming. But before I get started, I do need to let everyone know that I've gone ahead and updated my privacy policy because I respect your data. Now, of course, I'm just kidding. But I do have to show you our safe harbor statement, which is almost as bad. Don't make any purchasing decisions based on what I say here today. My name is Dan McGann. I'm a developer advocate at Oracle. I work in the database org, so I focus primarily on uh, database and JavaScript. And that intersection right now is, uh, for the most part, going to be in Node.js and with our Node.js driver. But we have some new and fun things coming as well, like the multilingual engine, which can run JavaScript inside the database. My contact info is here. We'll be in the slides. So if you have any questions in related areas, feel free to reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Let's do a quick demo. I'm going to need all of your support, so go ahead and pull out your cell phones for this one. <clears throat> you can't do a real-time talk without doing a real-time demo. So I'm just getting connected to a server here. And we start up an app. There it is. And then I will go to a URL. Now, I'm going to give you this URL in a second. If you can see it just fine and you want to go to it ahead of time, that's all right. But I'll give you a shortened URL in a moment. What this app is is a listing of cities. I just went online and I looked up for a list of cities that are just doing awesome these days. And this is what I came up with. There's 20 cities in here. Unfortunately, London didn't make the cut nor did New York City where I'm from. So I went ahead and deleted one from Germany and one from Canada and I inserted London and New York City as they should be, right? So what you see on the left is the current ranking. Right now everybody's tied for first because there are no votes cast. And then on the right you'll see a button. That is how you cast your vote. There are no rules. You can vote as many times for your favorite city as you. Oh my gosh, people are already voting. And New York City is killing it. I was actually going to do that. I'm guessing Mark over here also from New York City is in the vote. At any rate, you still have a chance to, oh, here comes London. At any rate, OK, I'm going to move over here to the dashboard. Now, for folks that can't see the, um, the URL here, you can just go to bit.ly slash rt dash lon. And what you'll see here is the total votes submitted. Notice a smaller number here on the right. This is the number of updates pushed. And then we can see as the voting occurs, wow, New York City is still killing it. I'm assuming he's using a laptop. Everyone else is on cell phones. It's not quite fair. If I give it just a few more minutes as London comes online, I'm sure he can't last forever like this. Wow, actually, we have Stockholm and, oop, yep, you see, there it happened. And at this point, what I'll do, just to make sure it stays like that, I'll shut down the web server, and the real-time demo is done, and London has won. Woohoo! All right, so notice this number, 457. Notice this number, 36. That's an important concept I'm going to come back to a little later in the talk. All right, so here's a high-level overview of the agenda. We're going to start by talking about the past and uh, how we got here, a little bit about where we're at currently with the technology and the options available, and then how you can mix in your database. So how we got here. It was about 20 years ago that HTTP became a thing. And at the time, it was just a very simple request response protocol. It really still is. So what would happen? The web server would request a web page or the web browser would request a web page from the server. The server would respond with a static web page. That worked pretty well, but eventually we figured out we could do better. We could involve a database in the mix and generate dynamic web pages. The way that would work, the web browser would still issue the same HTTP request, but then the web server would use some database driver technology to query database data. It would respond with that data. The web server would then use that to generate a dynamic web page. And that worked out great. Now, of course, a lot of you are saying, well, actually, that looks a little overly simplified. We use transactions, so it looks a bit more like this. We are sharding our database because we have a whole bunch of users. We have to scale the mid-tier and 
we just keep getting more and more users, and so our traffic is looking a bit more like this. I get it. Some of you are dealing with this reality today, but for the purposes of this talk, we'll keep it simple. So you could say, once the browser got the update uh, from the server or got the latest and greatest web page, it was like a cache. Uh, you could say that the state here is the same as it was in the database. But then something's going to happen, right? Some, somebody's going to do an update, insert, or delete in the database, and now this cache is out of sync. So the question became, like, how could we update this as quickly as possible? Well, we have had, for the longest time, the ability to do communication from the database to the mid-tier. So that wasn't the problem. We could notify the web server that it was out of sync. The problem was here. We couldn't go from the web server to the browser, and that was for good reasons related to security. So everybody started trying to fake it. Fake it till you make it. Who here is guilty of any of these? Come on. Come on. You can admit it. I'm guilty of all of them. So the first one here, the forever frame, that one actually works all the way back to IE6. It's where you would put an, uh, a frame hidden inside the web page, and you would use it to go get data and then proxy it back up to the parent page. Cool. But then we got Ajax. Who gave us Ajax? Anybody remember? It was actually Microsoft. We give Microsoft a lot of grief over IE, but it was Microsoft that gave us Ajax. And Ajax, of course, is asynchronous JavaScript and XML, the ability to essentially get data asynchronous to the original loading of the web page. And the polling idea was cool. You would just occasionally poll the mid-tier, say, hey, got any more data? Hey, got any new data? Hey, got any new data? And of course, the problem with that is that it was a lot of wasted requests because there was no new data, no changes yet. But also, there was a full round trip going to the mid-tier and back. And then we got Ajax long polling. This is what Google was initially using to bring Gmail to life. Uh, probably still using it, actually. It's not a bad technology. It just takes a lot to run it. The <coughs> thing is you have to establish a link. You say, hey, mid-tier, got any new data? And then you stay there and you wait. And when the mid-tier has new data, it'll go ahead and respond to your request with that new data. Then we got HTML server sent events. And chances are nobody in the room here has ever used them. And the reason is we got some better technology, which brings us to where we're at today. So some new technologies have emerged. The two that I like to talk about are WebSocket and WebRTC. WebRTC stands for real-time communication. And this being a real-time talk, you might think that I put that demo together using WebRTC. But in fact, I didn't. We'll talk about that one first. WebRTC is all about establishing peers directly, so peer-to-peer -peer communication. This is a really great technology if you're doing streaming audio and video, some kind of chat or communication application, or arbitrary data like a video game where you want to reduce the latency as much as possible. So hooking peers up directly makes a lot of sense. The problem with WebRTC, and it's not the end of the world, but it does require what's known as a turn server to get the clients initially connected. Um, not too bad. WebSocket, on the other hand, is all about that bi-directional communication that wasn't possible previously with simple HTTP. What's great about WebSocket is that it works over HTTP, and if both the client and the server support the standard, then it can go ahead and upgrade uh, to WebSocket. Um, this is what I ended up using. It's, it's really all about just the server being able to broadcast or push out data to many clients. And for this particular use case or demo, it just made more sense. I didn't need to link you guys up directly. Here's the current support for WebRTC. Took this just yesterday or the day before. What I tend to look at is this number up here in the upper right-hand corner. So if you're not familiar with this site, this is caniuse.com. And if you're wondering, can I use this latest and greatest feature of some you know, JavaScript language or browser HTML5 feature, you can come here, you can search it. And you can get an idea of where the browser support is at. And what you're looking for is a lot of green. If you're not seeing a lot of green, you don't want to do it on the public internet. But if you're in a corporate environment where you know the browsers folks are using, then you can take some risks. So uh, what we see here is IE11, not supported at all. They'll probably never add support there, of course, because they've gone over to Edge. I tend to look at this number here. If it's not up to like 90%, I probably wouldn't risk it. But of course, that may uh, not be the case for you. If, 
if you're flying in a corporate environment. This is WebSocket support. You're seeing a whole lot more green here. In fact, the only ones, and they seem to not even try, is, is Opera Mini. So if you're worried about support for Opera Mini, maybe this isn't the technology for you, but as you can see here, it's well above 90% at this point. So I think it's a pretty safe technology to use. So here's WebSocket in a nutshell. Little JavaScript snippet. So we start by declaring a variable called socket. It's equal to a new instance of a WebSocket and you just point the URL to your WebSocket server. And when the connection's opened, an event will happen, the open event, and you can add an event listener for that, this function, and the function will get an event and you can use it to send data down to the server, hello server. Uh, you can do the reverse as well. Um, from the server, you can send data to the client that's listening. So in this case, uh, the event would be message and the event would have any data that you wanted to send along with it. Um, basically, this is what I ended up using. But the problem with WebSocket in general is that it's a very low level protocol like most protocols should be. So folks don't tend to use it. They use higher level abstractions. And the one I recommend you look at is called Socket.io. And Socket.io is two parts. You're going to have a server side component for Socket.io running in Node.js. And then you're going to have a client side component for Socket.io running in the browser. And what's nice about Socket.io is it's kind of like its own protocol. It starts uh, with long polling. So if the browser doesn't support WebSocket, that's okay. So that 94%, if it wasn't where you wanted it, no problem. It'll use long polling instead and only upgrade to WebSocket if supported. It has a simplified API, and the API I showed you a moment ago didn't look terribly complex, but when you take into account, for example, let's say somebody comes into your, your app, they're looking at some data, and then they take the tube or the subway and then they come back out, well, they've been disconnected. So now you're going to have to write code to get them reconnected to the server, right? Socket.io deals with a lot of that lower level plumbing for you. So it's a really nice library to look at. It has support for multiplexing rooms and, of course, auto reconnect. Now, there are two basic scenarios you may find yourself in when it comes to real time data. The first is that you've created some public API where all changes to data must come through. That's a nice place to be if that's where you're at. It, it'll work out well for you. The other is that changes to data can occur outside your API and realistically that's going to happen the bigger your application gets. Um, multiple entry points into how the data is modified can occur and that gets a little bit more complex and then you need to involve the database to help out. Let's take a look at the first scenario. So this is all changes are going through your API. So we have a three-tier architecture here. We have the client on the left. We have the web server in the middle and then the database on the right. And so you're exposing this public API here. They're coming through a firewall. So what happens first, the clients are going to establish a WebSocket connection. The WebSocket connection will be a persisted connection. And next, some, somebody's going to use your API to make some kind of change to the data in the database. So in this case, imagine that's an insert, update, or delete. Then, of course, the web server is going to work with the database to actually make that change in persisted state. And then when you commit and it's successful, then you know the database is, is in sync. Now you're safe to just broadcast that out to, to everyone else. Sorry, skip the slide there. So once you can commit here, you can go ahead and broadcast that out. So you don't actually have to do anything more than that. The database is, is used as it normally would be. But what about scenario two, where changes could occur outside of the database? So in this case, just like before, the browsers are going to establish a WebSocket connection. Now the change is going to occur in the database outside of the API. So the question is, e even the, the web server at this point is unaware of the change, what do we need to do to address this? And the answer becomes, the database must notify the mid-tier of the change. Once that occurs, then the mid-tier can go back to the database, get the latest and greatest data, and then send that out to the clients. So those are the two scenarios. And let's focus now on the second, which is mixing in the database. So to make this work, uh, you'll need two ingredients or requirements for your database system. 
Uh, number one, you'll need some concept of events, and triggers are the very uh, most basic uh, example when it comes to events, but there are many more types of events that happen in databases. <clears throat> and then you'll need some ability to communicate, and we've had this ability for a long time now, as I mentioned before, um, TCP, HTTP, SMTP, you know, you'll need some ability to communicate when a change does occur. Different databases are going to have different features. Um, I am not terribly familiar. I know that, for example, Postgres has pub PubSub. Um, I know there's Firebase supporting real time out of the box. Mongo supports now, I forget what they call it, chain sets or something like that. Uh, an Oracle database, the two features I recommend you take a look at are continuous query notification and advanced queuing. So both of these features support uh, notification capabilities from the database. Let's focus on continuous query notification for this talk. And I apologize in advance, this does become a bit of a acronym soup here. So we're starting with CQN. CQN is all about registering queries with the database and getting events when things change. And there's two basic types of registration when you start to work with CQN. The first is object change notification or OCN, and then you have query result change notification or QRCN. And the first is simply concerned with the objects involved in the query, and the second is actually the result set of the query. So let's compare the two. Imagine uh, we take this query and register this query for change notification. Note that we're just looking at department 10. So with OCN, what's going to happen, Oracle Database is going to parse the query, identify which objects are involved, in this case just a single table, employees. And so if we do an insert on a new row with department of 12 with OCN, would this generate a notification? Yes, right? Because it's just the object itself has changed. In this case, employees has a new row. With QRCN, if you insert a new row with Department of 12, you're not going to get a notification because it doesn't satisfy the or change the result set of the query. That's just going to stay the same. So those are the basic differences. If you do choose to use QRCN, it has two different modes. You have guaranteed and best effort. So guaranteed mode is all about preventing false positives. Um, you can consider this transaction here on the right where first maybe you're increasing salary by 10, then you're decreasing salary by 10, and then you commit. So at this point, yeah, you've kind of changed some data and changed it back, but by the time you commit, there is no real net change. And so if you want to avoid a notification in this instance, you'll want to use guaranteed mode uh, just keep in mind that some queries are too complex for guaranteed mode. For those queries, you'll need to use best effort mode. And best effort is going to minimize the overhead associated with the feature. Uh, and it's also more flexible. So on the left here, we have an example of a query that's too complex for guaranteed mode because we're doing a sum on salary. If we take this same query and we register this using best effort mode, the database basically translates the query to the one you see on the right, and it'll work just fine, but of course you introduce uh, the potential for false positives, which is usually not a problem, especially if you're using uh, continuous query notification to basically create a mid-tier cache. You're just updating the cache a bit more frequently than you might otherwise. So here's a, an overview of the types of events that can generate notifications. Of course, DML, uh, insert, update, and delete would generate notifications, but also DDL. So if you're altering a table or dropping a table, things of that sort, those can generate notifications. Deregistration, so when you create a registration, you want to listen for changes. You may not be interested in changes anymore, so you may unregister that uh, listener, and of course, that'll generate an event. And then there's global events, like say the database is starting up or shutting down, things of that sort. There's all kinds of different things that you can listen for. When a notification occurs, you're going to get an object, and you'll have uh, all kinds of information within that telling you about the nature of the change that just occurred. So you'll get, for example, the type of event, insert, update, and delete, maybe database shutdown. 
the registration ID, which you may need for programmatic purposes. The names of the objects change, so if uh, you had maybe one or more tables involved in the change, you'll get those tables. If you've asked for row IDs, if you said when you registered the, the listener, uh, I'm interested in row IDs, it will do its best to give those to you. And uh, so in addition to the names of the, the tables, you'll get the row IDs as well. And you can use those to go and get the latest data from those rows. Um, right, yep, that's pretty much it. All right, so I wanna just show you what this looks like. Are there any node developers here? Just a few Java developers here? Ah, found you. All right. You must be node curious, at least, if you're here. So what I'll do is open up this. So I'm going to recreate a table here. And a local database. All right, so we now have an empty table. And I'm going to start. this demo here after I walk you through it. So this is a very simple Node.js application. What I do at first, I require in the Oracle database driver for Node.js, and then second, I bring in a database configuration file. So normally, that database configuration file would just contain the username, password, and connect string information to get connected to the database. But in this case, if you want to use the CQN capabilities, you'll need to set this events flag to true. Oh, whoops. Stay in here. All right. So we bring in that database configuration. And the next thing I do is I declare a function called run test, which you can see I'm invoking down below. So run test is going to use the driver to get a connection. And then it's going to use the connections subscribe method to register a query with CQN. You have to give a name for your subscription, uh, which you can use then later as a reference to unsubscribe if needed. And then you provide a SQL query, in this case a really basic SQL query on the table I just created, which is now empty, and then a callback. Now the callback is just a JavaScript function, which we see below. And so every time a change occurs here in this query, this callback will be invoked and it will be passed a notification object which I'm going to log out to just see the contents of that object. So let me kill the previous server. All right, so it says a subscription is created. And so now what I'll do is insert a row into the new table. And when I do that, I want to keep this other window open so you can see it. All right, so I'm inserting here. We have our row, but keep in mind it's not until we commit that the actual change occurs. So as soon as I commit here, we see the change happen over here. And you're starting to see some numbers, some random numbers. We can see that tables were affected. It's the hr.t table. Um, you can see minimal information here. But the numbers can be a bit confusing, the operation and the type. So I'll just show you briefly. And this is about 10 hours ago. The database driver team actually published this on GitHub. So this is actually in the wild now. It's not something that you can't go home and do today. Um, you'll see in the doc on GitHub all of the, um, the different constants that we've exposed so that you can work, work with the, the numbers that are, that are going to come back from the APIs. So uh, here you're seeing operations. Uh, oops, let me go up a bit. Here's a namespace, quality of service flags, grouping, class, time, or message type, rather. So all the constants are here. And I'll just show you one more demo. So this time I'll shut this one down. And 
in startup number two. Actually, I should have walked you through that first. Let me do that. Right, so this one's rather similar to the first. Here's our run test, only this time when we get a subscription, same query, same basic callback, but now I'm using quality of service flags. In this case, I'm saying I want it to be query or the, the one that actually looks at the result of the query. So the default is going to be object change. If you want to upgrade that, you need to specify this flag. And I'm also telling it that I am, in fact, interested in row IDs. And this is a bitwise or operator between the two. Technically, you could just use plus here, uh, but the C developers prefer it when I use the, the bitwise or for some reason. At any rate, when the message comes in, because I've asked for more data, hopefully we'll get some, some row ID information. So I'm, the, the logging here is just a bit more complex to log that information out. So I'll come back to our table and I'll insert another row and another row and we'll commit that. And so what you're seeing here on the right is we're getting the row IDs of the rows that were changed. And of course we can delete the data out as well. did not work. Sorry about that. Live demo. Cool. It's new functionality. All right. That's really it in a nutshell. Uh, this, as I mentioned, was released about 10 hours ago. Uh, so it is on GitHub now. I put some next steps up here. So if you're interested in learning more about CQN, this is to the doc on that particular feature. It's a rather robust feature. I'm just kind of touching the tip of the iceberg here. And also for the CQN uh, API, now in the Oracle database driver for Node.js, if you're interested in learning more about that, there's a link to that GitHub page as well. Are there any questions on this feature? Somebody's got to have a question. There's usually one person that's interested in the performance implications of this feature, right? Somebody had this question. So the truth is the, the, the doc actually says that this feature is best uh, used in the mid-tier caching scenario and for tables that are infrequently modified, infrequently in, in air quotes, because what does that really mean? Uh, it, it's kind of obtuse. So. I've had folks come up to me after having done this talk in the past telling me they're using this feature in production with high OLTP transaction rates. Uh, so I think it really depends on a number of factors, including, of course, the kind of hardware that you have available. But at the end of the day, if you think back to the polling example, this is simply going to be a, a better feature than just going to the database and asking it over and over, had there been any changes. So when you need the feature, it's there for you to leverage. Excellent question, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So the, the question was with respect to authentication and, and I'm assuming a concern of when the database is notifying the mid-tier, that communication having some data that could be sniffed or something along these lines. The, the notification itself does not contain data at the moment. However, so, so what you would need to do when you notify the mid-tier that a change has occurred, the mid-tier then has to come back, use regular database authentication. Uh, use SQL net encryption. So of course we can secure the data transfer currently because the notification that goes out isn't going to contain any sensitive data. But we are considering uh, you know, that additional round trip having to go back to the database to get the changes 
uh, is, is just overhead, right? Latency so, we're looking, exploring, I should say, options to uh, actually have the notification push data. And at that point, I think we'd have to consider uh, SQL net encryption or whatever we could use to encrypt that data. Thank you. Yes, sir. So the question was, are we considering support uh, for this feature in other languages? I should say that uh, this feature has been around since at least 10G. The actual query side has been around since 11G. Um, so object change since 10G. Maybe even before, I'm not sure. Um, Java, if in, and a lot of hands went up for Java, Java has full support for this feature now for, for a long time. Uh, it's the other languages that are, are coming on board now. And uh, the support is now in our OCI layer and, and the lower level C layers. So we build a uh, database driver uh, on top of that for, for various scripting languages such as Python, uh, Perl, and so on, PHP. So now that we have the support in the C layer, it's, it's really just a binding, like putting in the effort to, to, to tie it in to the lightweight layers for the other languages. So we, will, we should see support in the near future for the other languages. Any other questions? So in Node.js, uh, we, we have the connection pool in Ethernet. So that's, uh, we have been with the Node.js thread size to accommodate the connection pooling. So I'm interested to yeah. know if the, the subscription actually uses. Ah, excellent question. So the, the question was uh, multifaceted. We'll, we'll say, does the subscription use a connection? Yeah. Right? So you saw in the examples that I ran, uh, I needed to get a connection and then call connection.subscribe. At that point, I could just release the connection back to the pool. So the database is independent. It's not like it has to leave a connection open to send the notification down. The database has its own ability to communicate then. And in fact, I should say, let's say you're setting this up in the cloud. So you have your mid-tier uh, and, and you have various uh, nodes in the mid-tier that are connecting to the database. How does the database know then how to communicate back to those servers, right? It's got to know the IP address and perhaps a port to communicate on. So uh, there are uh, settings when you register the subscription. I didn't show you those. But there's IP address and port. So when your node server boots up, you can get the IP address. You probably want to use a predefined port because you're going to open up some firewall settings and allow communication on that predefined port. Otherwise, it's going to be random. Uh, which you could do as well if it's behind a firewall, I suppose. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll specify the IP in the port, and it does not use a connection. It communicates independently. Any other questions? I stand between you and lunch. <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you very much for coming.